I've got a thousand different, well, not more or less, titles I could give to my message tonight. But <clears throat> I'm going to call it, finally, I've called it this, How We Got Here. How We Got Here. In the first chapter of Romans, we have a step-by-step roadmap of the degeneration of society. Normally, when I teach or preach from the first chapter of Romans, I start at the first and go down verse after verse and show how step by step a, uh, a nation or a people go into sin, starting with the first step into sin and the second and the second, the third and fourth and fifth, and on down until we show the condition of the nation or of the people. Now tonight, I'm going to start where we are and work backwards. In other words, I'm not going to say verse 21 and then 22 and then 23. I'm going to start with the condition we find, in which we find ourselves in Romans chapter 1 at the end of the chapter, at the end of the chapter. Then I'm going to work back and show you how we got here. And so the message is entitled, How We Got Here. Now then, everybody wake up and uh, join the service. We'd glad to have you back with us anytime you can uh, wake up. Two or three folks are enjoying a wonderful nap. Did you hear about the lady who got insomnia? And they tried everything. They tried pills. They tried everything in the world. And finally she found the cure for insomnia. She went to church and heard a sermon and went right off to sleep. And uh, so uh, uh, I want you to listen now because what I'm going to give you tonight is going to take your really a lot of gray matter and you've got to follow me very carefully. So look please in Romans 1 verse 26. Now, in Romans 1, 26 through 32, we have a picture of our generation, the complete degeneration of man. Notice now, verse 26, For this cause God gave them up to vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Does that sound like uh, <clears throat> our generation? Yes, it does. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their era which was meet. It sounds like the homosexual craze of our day, doesn't it? Sounds like the lesbian and homosexual of our day. Notice in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, or what they were doing. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, how do we get here? Here we are tonight in a nation that's sold to filth and indecency, immorality, nudity. Here we are tonight in America Jim Lyons, I told Jim Lyons about, oh, it must have been 12, 13 years ago. I said, I said, Jim, the day is going to come in our generation when there will be nude mixed bathing in swimming pools and on beaches. And Jim was a bit offended. Why? He said, oh, I don't believe it. Why, preacher? He said, no. And he came back to me recently and said, preacher, I never thought it would happen, but it has happened in our generation. Did you know, here we are tonight, a generation of people, the many of, of whom uh, go, uh, 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 females go with topless bathing suits, and uh, you drive out, fly out to Los Angeles and get off the airplane, drive down the street near the airport, and you'll see sign after sign, topless waitresses serve here. And by the way, the last time I was out there, those same restaurants had signed, bottomless waitresses serve here. Can you feature that? Can you imagine a a generation as wicked and as vile and as rotten and as sordid and as licentious as ours? 
our generation, um, in, on most, take most any state university you want to choose, and you'll find communism is taught right there in the university. And take most any state university you want to choose, and you'll find that nudity is allowed in plays right there on the campus of the university. A high school here in this area, at least one high school, has already had a nude uh, on, the, on the stage in the high school at a play on the platform in the auditorium of the high school. Here we are in a generation where it, it, it won't belong. Now you watch it, it won't belong until marijuana will be legal like liquor is now. Well, you say, how do you know marijuana is going to be legal? Because liquor already is, it's as sorry as marijuana. A nation that will uh, destroy itself with alcohol will destroy itself with dope and narcotics a little later. Here we are in America tonight. Our, our schools, you can go to, uh, students that go to Hammond High School have told me this, and uh, numbers of them have. You can go to Hammond High, and if you want some narcotics, you can get dope right there at Hammond High School. Or one student said the other day, yeah, I know where to go in Hammond Tech and get uh, dope. A student from Munster High told me the other day, I could take you to a place and show you where you can get dope in Munster High School. Here we are in a generation where right down there within two or three blocks of the police department, there's a, a place that advertises, get your head supplies here. I mean, within three blocks, police department, get your head supplies here. What, what are head supplies? Narcotics, dope, heroin, so forth. Get your head supplies here. Advertise right there within three blocks of the police department and city hall. That's our generation. Our generation, free love, new morality, indecency, nudity, homosexuality. Um, out in the, uh, California recently, the United Church of Christ ordained a homosexual to preach the gospel. And in the ordination service, he admitted he was a homosexual. And now we have, it's our generation, uh, denominations ordaining avowed homosexuals to preach the gospel. I got an anonymous letter the other day. Somebody wrote me a letter. <laughs> and and, and, and <laughs> forgive me for laughing, but it's, it, it's not, not funny, it's sad, but it's so funny too. They said, with the very idea of you intimating that all homosexuals are effeminate. And, uh, but, uh, do you know, listen, do you know it is as dangerous, and I get as much criticism today for preaching against homosexuality as I used to get preaching against cigarettes? Do you know that today people threaten to whip me because I preach against lesbianism and homosexuality? Our generation. Well, right here in this area, you have churches who belong to denominations that have ordained preachers, pastors. One man said, ordained to preach. Uh, pardon me. One, uh, one, sorry to say male. One it said. Ordained to preach. And said, I hope to have a, let's see, I hope to have a meaningful relationship with another male. Hmm? I just like to walk down the street and see your pastor petting some guy. I guess in their church he stops and says, Hey, you two fellas, quit holding hands while I preach. <coughs> it's our generation. I mean, you know, it used to back out of stuff. Now it's pulpit stuff. Used to be uh, certain areas of town, uh, shady kind of places. And now it's the pulpit, it's the preacher, it's the pastor. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we don't watch out, we'll become adjusted to this wicked kind of dirty society. And a, a, a sin will not be exceeding sinful to us anymore. Now, how did we get here? How did we get here? All right, I want you to notice very, very carefully, and I'll show you how we got here. The first thing is I showed you where we are in verses 26 through 32. Now, if you want to know how we got here, look back to verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, what was the step right above our licentious, lustful uh, society and our condition now of serving the creature more than the Creator? Or shall we say humanism? Serving the creature of what I think is more important than what God thinks. And we worship the body and the mind and the soul of man. 
and uh, what got us there. All right, look back to verse 23, and you'll find that. And change the glory of the corruptible God into a, <coughs> an image made like unto corruptible uh, a man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Idolatry. You see, it's the kind of society we have, and uh, right above that, worshiping the creature, and right above that, idolatry. And uh, what caused us to get into idolatry? Look back, if you would please, to verse 21, and you'll find that. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now look, now I want you to go out a step at a time down and show how, how you get down. Look at verse 21 now. Because that when they, when they knew God, okay, here's a generation of people, here's a nation, young people, here's a nation that knows God. Here's some people that know God. Now, what's the start now? They glorified him not as God. Where does the nation start down? They don't glorify the Lord. Where does the nation begin deteriorating? Not glorifying God. They believe in him, but don't glorify him. When you quit glorifying God, you're in danger of starting down. As long as you can keep your hallelujah, you won't be in any serious trouble. As long as you can keep your praise the Lord in your heart and say, thanks be to God. And praise God for his goodness. You won't get in any serious problem. Where did they start down? They did not glorify God. They believed him. They knew him. But didn't glorify him. <laughs> and so what happened? You know what? God wants us to love him. God not only wants us to be saved, God wants us to love him. God wants us to glorify him. God wants us to praise him. God wants us to adore him. God wants us to worship him. So what happened? First they knew God, but they glorified him not as God, and neither were thankful. Now then, look at verse 22, the next step down. <coughs> Professing themselves to be wise, hey, they went to college. And they got some learning. Like the fellow said, his boy went off to college and got some learning. And the fellow said, what chains do you see in him? He said, used to when he'd plow a row, he'd get through plowing, he'd say to them, you, whoa, Reb, turn around and get up. Now he says, halt, Rebecca, pivot and proceed. And... Uh, so uh, uh, they got off to, got off to school, and you've taken a little Greek, you've taken some Hebrew, and you've taken some philosophy, and you've taken some psychology, and now you're wise. You have a degree. You've been off to college, and now you've got uh, your your doctor so and so, or you have a BA or a BS or a MA, and uh, and so you profess yourself to be wise. And the Bible says, when you get wise, you become a fool. Our country is full of a bunch of little fools running around here thinking they're wise. As long as, listen to me, as long as you can keep praising God, you'll keep abasing yourself. As long, the bigger you can make God, the lower you'll make yourself. The higher you can exalt Him, and the higher you can raise Him, and the more you can praise Him, the less you'll think of yourself. Because praising to God is defacing to the flesh. And but, but here are these people, they, 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 they knew God. What happened? but they, they didn't uh, glorify him as God. What else? They weren't thankful. What else? They got wise, and when they did, they became fools. Now what happened in verse 23? And changed the glory of God, of the uncomfortable God, into an image made like to corruptible man. What did they do? Listen to me. Uh, when a Christian quits praising God, then he thinks he's wise. And when a Christian becomes wise, then he wants to conceive his own God in his own mind. Or with his hands. And idolatry sets in. Now follow me. Immorality, are you listening? Immorality is a direct result to idolatry or of idolatry. Idolatry always comes before immorality. When a nation loses its morals, it is as a result of idolatry. Now what does idolatry result from? Idolatry results from man thinking he's wise in his own mind. God's not like the Bible says he is. I think he's another way. Now, you may get him a piece of wood and carve his God out, or you may carve his God out in his mind. But whatever he's doing, he's making his own God. And what happens is this. When a man makes his own God, then he has no resources at all for morality or principles or decency or chastity or purity. All right. Why? Because he's lost, he has lost his concept of a God that made him. Why did he make his own God? He became wise in his own eyes. Why, boys? Why did he become wise in his own eyes? 
because he quit glorifying God. Listen to me. The safest, safest thing in this world and the surest way to keep this church from going into... Uh, young people, no talking while I preach. Everybody listening, the folks behind you that want to hear, and I intend for them to be able to do so. The safest thing in this world to keep a church from getting wise in its own eyes is to praise the Lord. You know, colleges, Christian colleges, that, that, that soon drift away into to neo-orthodoxy, you know where it starts? They quit praising God. Dr. Bob Jones Finn used to say, Hey, fella, you listen, you, you listen while I preach. You're in the white tide. Don't you dare hit a fella beside you anymore while I'm preaching. As long, Dr. Bob Jones Finn used to say, Every time we hire a Ph.D., we have a week's revival to offset it. Now, what's he saying? He's saying this. When a school quits saying, Praise the Lord, the Bible's true. Thank God Jesus is coming. And all of a sudden, the Bible becomes somewhat of a mathematics book, and there's no amen. Listen, if, if you can keep your shout, you'll never degenerate. Keep your, keep your, hallelujah, keep your, praise the Lord, keep the glory in the heart, keep the, the, what, the fire burning and the joy and the thrill and the excitement. I'm saved and blessed be God, I'm saved. As long as you can say that, you won't get very far away. But here these people knew God, but they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. Then what happened? They became wise. They went off to college. They got some education. Then what happened? They decided they knew more about God than they thought they did. And so they studied Karl Barth over in Germany and found out that God wasn't the old fundamental God. And hell no longer has fire. And heaven no longer has golden streets. And Jesus is no longer no, no going to come again, literally. And, uh, and born again. That's just a term. And before you know it, you profess yourself to become wise. And the Bible says you become his fool. Then what do you do? Then you make your own God. Then what do you do? Then you go into homosexuality and lewdness and all kinds of wicked licentiousness and fornication. Why? Because you started out at the honor, you quit glorifying God. Now then, basically we got here because of idolatry. Now I'm going to give you tonight four different types of heathen idolaters in this educated society of ours. The first idolater is the fellow who believes in centralized government. Centralized government is idolatry. <laughs> Fellas, line up beside me here, would you please? Line up beside me here. I'm going to let you have a farm over here, and you plow your farm. And, and not, don't plow it yet. We'll all plow at the same time. You can have yours here. I'll have mine. You have yours. You have yours. And you have yours. Okay. Now then, uh, uh, we're, I believe God's going to take care of my needs. Dear God, I pray you'd help me to... Re to, ha to to make a good crop this year and give me rain, give me sunshine, give me strength to take care of my crop. You believe God will do it? Huh? Okay, then I don't need a pension check from the government, do I? Do I? I don't need Social Security, do I? Huh? Why? Because i got faith in God, right? Hey, how about you? Yes, sir. Well, pray. You going to make it all right? Yes, sir. Yeah, you want a check from Washington every month? Oh. Okay. How about you? You going to pray? Well, pray. Okay. You going to be okay? Do you need to be on Social Security? Okay. How about you? Yes. You going to pray? Yes, sir. Pray. Dear Lord, help me. <laughs> yeah, Lord, do help him. <coughs> All right. You believe God's going to take care of you? Yes, you believe God's going to take it? Pray. Okay. How about you? Okay. We're going to pray. Okay. Now, by the way, that America was built that way. There was a day when you didn't have to get a check in the mailbox from Washington, D.C. to make it. Why? We believe in God. That's why. Man got on his knees and looked up to God and said, Dear God, give me strength to take care of my, uh, my, my field and give me strength to take care of my crop and give me rain and sunshine. And he claimed the promise, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. But all of a sudden I find myself a little bit backslidden. Okay, boys and girls, girls on the second row, you watch me while I'm preaching. I find myself a little backslidden. And so I don't pray like I used to, and I don't think it's going to rain. Oh my, what if it doesn't rain? Oh, I won't have any crops if it doesn't rain. Oh my, hey, fella, let's get together here. Uh, how about your crop? You, you backslidden too. How about your crop? 
Oh, very good. Uh, you, you, you worried about it? How about yours? Got worms in it. Got worms in it. You worried about it? Uh-huh. How about yours? I'm worried about mine. You worried about yours? Huh? Let me ask you a question. Is Philippians 4.19 still in the Bible? Will God still supply all of our needs? Huh? If we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, will all these things still be added to us? Huh? Okay, except we, we don't have faith to believe that anymore. So what do us do? Fellas, let's, let's get together here and let's form a co-op. <clears throat> let's form a... Let's, let's all get together and, and I'll put in 10% of, of everything I make. You put in 10% of what you make and all of us put in 10%. Okay, get money out of pocket. Put 10% in here. Now then, if any of us has a bad year, then he can take out of this kitty here, you see, this 10%. Why do we do that? We just formed a socialistic community. We just, uh, we, we just decided to vote for McGovern. Why? Because we lost our faith in God. Oh, so centralized power is as a direct result of losing one's faith in God. Is that right? Okay. Now, if God can supply my needs, I don't need this co-op, do I? Huh? But if I'm a little worried about it, I'm go- so what am I saying? I'm saying that we have built ourselves an idol. That's what the Tower of Babel was, an idol. That's what left-wingers are, idolaters. That's what c- communism is, idolatry in its fullest degree in its final state when we don't trust God we trust the state to take care of it and so thank you fellas that's what centralized power is all about hey come back fellas <coughs> let's form a denomination and we'll all be pastors at nomination now we're all pastors well God's going to take care of me I'm going to preach the Bible and God's going to take care of me I know he is how about you think he's going to take care of you how about you are you going to preach the Bible and God's going to supply your needs. God's going to give you a church. How about you? What if your deacons vote you out? I'll get another church. Get another church. How are you going to get it? God will take care of you. God will take care of you. How about you? God will you what if your folks vote you out of the church? He'll still supply. Or what if they cut your salary? He'll supply. How about you? Is that a fact? What if you lose your church? And God's going to take care of you. Hey, these sound like good men of God, don't they? I see. Okay. By the way, God will do exactly that. He'll do exactly that. But uh, I get preaching one of these days, and my, my children are teenagers now, and I've got a lot of bills to pay, and I get up and I say, Hey, I tell you, you mini-skirted, long-haired rascal. And the uh, three deacons go to punch each other and say, I say, Oh, my. Oh, they might be going to fire me. I walk out the door, and there those three deacons are talking outside the door. Anytime three deacons get together and talk, it worries a fire out of me. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, they get together, and they're talking outside the door. I say, hey, fellas, tell what we're going to do. Uh, what, what, if, what if my deacons fired me? What would happen? Uh, what, what would I do? Hey, what let's do? Let's form a denomination. Huh? And well, let's elect the superintendent. He can recommend us to other churches in case we lose more we got now. Okay. Okay, nomination is now in order for a superintendent. Mr. Vineyard, all right. And second motion. All in favor, Mr. Vineyard, raise your hand. Hey, Mr. Vineyard, good buddy. <laughs> I'd like to take you out to eat, Mr. Vineyard. My dear Dr. Vineyard. Oh, he. we're glad to have beloved Mr. Vineyard with us. You know why? Because i got to keep in good mood with him. Why? Because he's my hope to get a church in case my deacons are going to fire me. What happened? Centralized power is always a substitute for God. Always is. Any time centralization of power in the church, in the country, any time centralization of power is a part of the philosophy of a nation, what? They've lost their faith in God. You say, I don't believe it. I dare you to check America, and you'll find in direct proportion to her losing her faith in God, you'll find her going toward communism. Thank you, fellas. Communism is complete dependence on the state. It's a canopy of protection and security that is a substitute for God, and substitutes for God are idols. Where did America get where she is tonight? Because socialism and centralized power and bureaucracy, all of it, is caused by lack of faith in Almighty God. It's idolatry. <coughs> When you lose your faith in God, you get... By the way, did you know that's what cities are all about? That's what cities are all about. Anybody here 
when a storm came up like we thought was going to come up tonight, ever said, oh, I wish you were with somebody. My mother used to say, let's go over to see Miss Jones. Now, Miss Jones was a little old bitty shrimp. She couldn't, the wind could have taken her and blown her away. But somehow or other, if we get with Miss Jones, is Miss Jones able to protect us? No, girls, no, not able to protect us. But there's some security about getting together, isn't there? Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Could you walk alone with God and make it? Could you walk in a storm alone? Do you know one reason we're so bereft of leaders in America? There are so few real men who can walk alone without being propped up. You know why? We've lost our faith in God. <laughs> Every once in a while, I get on an airplane that's having a little trouble, and everybody just goes, oh, it's I was flying to Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> and an and, uh, 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 engine caught on fire, on an, an Electra uh, prop plane, an engine caught on fire. Well, now, I'll be honest with you. It is not the most blessed feeling in the whole world. Look out! I mean, it keep, I mean, if it's cold, you can keep warm. But who wants to keep warm? It's expensive. And uh, so uh, uh, the, the uh, pilot came on and said, "Ladies and gentlemen, we've lost one engine." And he said, uh, "We'll feather that engine." But he said, "It, it shows it's on fire." The machine, the little button here is red. Ray knows what I'm talking about. Ray Newton, he's a, he's a pilot. There's some little button up there. He said, "It shows it's on. The engine is burning." And so uh, <clears throat> one stewardess went and. And, and opened the bathroom door and locked herself in the bathroom. And the fellow beside me got his pillow. And, and he got a pillow and, and he, he put his head in the pillow. And I said, uh, <laughs> forgive me, but I said, it's still burning whether your head's in the pillow or not. <laughs> he said, it's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not funny, but I said, Good night. It's not going to help any because you do it like that. You know, like a little boy and girl said, come find me. And uh, so uh, we came in and we circled, circled at Metropolitan Airport in, in, in Detroit and uh, looked down and, and you never saw me a flashing lights in your life. I mean, fire trucks all over that place. And I said, hey, hey, look at there. He said, what, 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 what? He said, what, 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 what are those? I said, they're fire trucks. He said, ho, 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 ho. I said, they have us in mind. He said, now, now, don't misunderstand me. I was very, very happy to get on the ground. But uh, not many men can walk alone. I got an O'Hare Field on a Convair 880 Delta Airlines jet, no, TWA, jet plane to fly to St. Louis, Missouri. And I sat down by a lady, and the plane, the plane was loading, and I said, My name is Jack Howe. She said, My name is so-and-so. I said, Hey, do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? She said, There's no heaven. I said, Well, yeah, there's a place where you go suffer forever. She said, There's no such thing as pain. Oh. I said, Well, you, you, prepare, you get better prepared to die. She said, No such thing as being, uh, as dying. You just think you're dead. Well, that, that interested me, because, and so she's a Christian scientist which is neither Christian nor science, but uh, she's Christian science. She said, no such thing as death. Nothing to worry about. You think you're dead. A little boy one time uh, went to his mother, his mother's Christian science, and said, Mama said, Mr. Jones down, down the street is sick. She said, no, he's not sick. He just thinks he's sick. The little boy came back the next day and said, Mama, remember that man down the street that thought he was sick? He thinks he's dead now. <coughs> and so... Uh, so we, we got on out, out the runway, and we, and we took off in the air, and, and that, that lady all of a sudden, she held on to the side. And the, the flaps came, the uh, landing gear came up, and she went, oh. And I said, you think you're scared, don't you? <laughs> I said, you're afraid you're going to think you're dead, too, aren't you? She said, it's not funny, it's not funny. You know, we've got a generation of folks that can't much make it alone. We want to huddle up together. Did you know God can take care of His own? Huh? Did you know God's able to take care of your need? Young preachers, there's a God in heaven, and that God in heaven can give you a church if He wants you to have a church. 
You don't have to get propped up by some denominational secretary who messes with some business that's not his own. God can take care of his men. If God can't take care of you, preach another God. Centralized government is idolatry. And one of the reasons why we tonight are facing a wicked, vile, sensual, nude, homosexual, adulterous generation is because of the idolatry of centralized power. There's a second <coughs> idolatry in America tonight that's caused our problem, and that's humanism. Humanism is mental idolatry. The pagan in Africa gets a piece of wood and, and builds him a god. The intellectual in the university gets his mind and builds himself a god. The lady said to me just recently, she said, I have my own concept of God. And I said, you know what that is? That is, I, that is self-idolatry. Now, you listen to me. The same old song and dance comes out of every university in America. Any professor you will talk to, nine out of ten of them, they have the same philosophy. Um, I have my own God, and it's up to each man to, 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 to have his own God, and to each, every man decides what he thinks about God. Well, that's, that's pagan idolatry. Amen. That is you deciding with your mind what God is like, and it's, it's you building your God. And that's what humanism is all about. How can you find humanism, or define, tell humanism? Anytime you find anybody that lowers Jesus, he's humanistic in his philosophy. And how do you find about it that exalts the flesh? She's humanistic in his philosophy. This lady I mentioned a while ago, a very nice lady. She said, uh, she said, I don't believe in heaven or hell. But I said, the Bible says it. But she said, I don't believe the Bible. But I said, it tells about Jesus. I don't believe that Jesus was God. I think he was just a man. Now, was it surprising to hear her say in the next breath that she didn't believe, didn't agree with me? Because, she said, she thinks man is good. You see, that's the next step. After you think God is not good, man is good. Humanism is pulling God down and raising man up. And that's what I... Listen, 99 and 44 100% of the universities in this nation tonight are built on humanistic philosophy of exalting man and bringing down God. She said, everybody's good. I said, oh, everybody's good. I said, who's killing all these people around the country? Who's robbing all these banks? Everybody's good. The honest, simple truth is, ladies and gentlemen, when you have a little God and a big man, you've got nothing but homosexuality and licentiousness and wickedness and a vulgar society. Why? Because idolatry is the, 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 the forerunner of paganism and lewdness. And so humanism. What's the prevention? Again, I say to glorify him. There's a third kind of idolatry, and that is substituting the means as an end. You recall the story over in the uh, book of Numbers, isn't it? Yes, Numbers. Um, the story of the brazen altar. The Israelites were in the wilderness. I'm sorry, the brazen serpent. The Israelites were in the wilderness. And uh, all of a sudden, fiery serpent. I never forget. I was preaching over here in the other auditorium one night. And I, I was talking about the fiery serpent. And I said, serpents everywhere. I mean, no fire serpents everywhere. I said, you'd come home at night, you'd open the door, and a snake would be on the door, and it, and it bites you on the hand. You'd, you'd open the cabinet to get some, get some dishes out, and there'd be a snake up on top of the dish there looking at you. And I said, everywhere. I, in the garage, there were snakes. I said, snakes everywhere. I looked down the front row, and every kid in the front row had his head his... Why? He won't get bit by those snakes. That's why. And but snakes were everywhere, really. And and they, the fiery serpents were biting the Israelites, and they were dying, just falling over dead with a thousand. And Moses came to God and said, "God, what can we do?" And God said, "Get you, get you a piece of brass, and I want you to beat that piece of brass and make it look like a serpent, and I want you to put that brazen serpent on a pole and hold that pole high." And tell all the Jews, if they'll turn and look at that brazen serpent, they'll live. They will not die of the snake bite. And, uh, oh, it's wonderful. Was it the serpent, was it the piece of brass that healed them? No, it was God that healed them. But you know what happened? The Jews, some of the Jews got healed. 
And they said, oh, thank God. I got healed. We're looking at that brazen serpent. It wasn't long. So they'd, they'd, they'd have religious exercises. And they'd walk by that brazen serpent and they'd kneel that brazen serpent. I'm not sure what sign they made or they knelt. But they made some kind of a sign and they knelt that brazen serpent. And what, what happened? They were worshiping the mean instead of the end. It wasn't that brazen serpent that made them well. It was the God of heaven that made them well. But they worshipped the mean as, as an end. And that's idolatry. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if we do that, God will take away that mean. I know people who've come to churches like this, and they said, oh, I need to be saved. And they came to Christ, and they trusted the Savior, and they fell in love with the church, and that's wonderful. Nothing wrong with that. I think we have the greatest church on the face of the earth, and I thank God for it. Nothing wrong with that. But, oh, before you know it, you put the church above God. And the Lord Jesus looks down from heaven, and he sees us worshiping the church instead of the Savior. And one of these days, the Lord will come and remove the church, and you won't have the good old First Baptist Church in Hammond. Ladies and gentlemen, the best way in the world to ensure this church being like it is tonight it's for every one of us to always praise the Lord and exalt Him and love Him most of all. Oh, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was the feeling, now it is His word. Once His gifts I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now Himself alone. All in all is Jesus. Of Jesus will I sing. Everything is Jesus and Jesus is everything. Just keep praising Him and keep exalting Him and keep loving Him. Oh, love the church but worship God. Love the church, but praise Jesus. Love the church, but not ever even close to our love and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ. I love First Baptist Church, Hammond, but listen to me. I'd walk out the doors tonight never to walk back in again if it came in between my worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not the First Baptist Church, Hammond, that plucked you out of sin, my brother. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. He used us as a tool. And but never, 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 never. Let us tonight reach up and let's say we love our church, but take it off the throne. He alone deserves a place of worship in our hearts. And before you know it, he takes it away. That's where that's where baptismal baptismal regeneration came in. I love to baptize. Man alive. I I enjoy getting that water up there and, and baptizing folks. I could do it all day and all night. And I love to do it. And um, but uh, I'll, you get where you love it so much before you know it. You think it saves people. And the means becomes the end. And the Lord's okay. That, that's where lewdness comes. That's where we get in all this trouble. That's, only, that's where denominational hierarchies come. And that's where you get the place of where uh, we love our denomination, even who doesn't preach the truth. I wouldn't pull out. I wouldn't quit the schools. I wouldn't quit sending money to support that wicked program. Why? You have allegiance to the denomination rather than to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's a fourth kind of idolatry. And listen carefully to this one. It's the idolatry of putting men before God. Paul and Barnabas had, had performed some miracles. And the people came down and fell before them and said, One of you is a Mercury and the other two, uh, Jupiter. One is Jupiter and one is Mercury. Mercury. And they bowed down before Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas said, Get up! We're not God! Don't worship us as God. Don't you recall when Peter came to the house of of uh, Cornelius. They bowed down and worshipped him. Peter said, Stand up, I also am a man. Oh, let me say, I want you to love me. I mean that. I need your love. I need your prayers. I need your help. Today, I was so pleased. Uh, Mrs. Clara Bennett passed away. And she was up in years. No, no talking, please, in the service. She was up in years. And Mrs. Bennett passed away. And before she died, they asked her if she had any requests at all. She said, yes. They're going to they're gonna bury her in Kentucky. <laughs> and uh, everybody, that, that, if you die and you're saved, you die and go to Kentucky when you die. And uh, so they're going to bury her in Kentucky. They asked her if she had any requests, and she said, yes. Before we take my body to Kentucky, would you have Brother Hiles come and conduct a memorial service for me? That's my only request. And I was so pleased that she'd want me to do that. She loved me. And her daughter said today, Oh, how my mother loves you. And that made me feel real good on the inside. A while ago, I, I came out the office door. And as I opened the door, I stepped on something. And uh, uh, it was on a, on a sack of tomatoes. I just, I just squashed one is all. 
and uh, but it's on a stack of tomatoes, and uh, that somebody had raised some organic grown tomatoes. You know how you raise organic tomatoes? You play the organ all the time they're growing, and uh, so uh, uh, and, and there's some organic tomatoes, and uh, my heart was warm. Somebody loved me enough to give me the tomatoes, and uh, uh, this morning I walked. I got went up to baptizing. Went out in the alley, and a little girl, she must have been about seven or eight, she came up and said, Hello, Brother Hiles! She reached out and she took my hand, walked with me hand in hand down the alley, and I just enjoyed it so much. I think she was 19. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but the little girl, about seven years of age, we walked down the alley, and uh, and she squeezed my hand. Uh, the other day I was out in the back in the alley uh, coming in. A little girl, about five years old, came up, and she took my hand, and she went, uh, that means do you love me? And I squeeze back, yes, I do. And she squeezed back, how much can we squeeze real hard? For four or five years of age, and uh, I like that. I liked it very much, very much. This morning up in the baptismal dressing room, one of, one of the men, uh, we got the greatest preacher in the world, and I didn't mind that. Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I don't have to have that, but I don't mind that. But let me say this. Don't ever put me where Jesus ought to be. Never. There are two reasons for that. One reason is I want him to have the praise. But the other reason is this. Did you know that sometimes God will take away from you that thing that you put in his place? And I don't want to be taken away. But he will. 